I'm going to hit. Oh. Welcome back to another episode of Be Beautiful Adaptive Warrior. And I am your host, Angie Huser, and I have a very special guest with us today. I'm excited. As you all know, April was Limb Loss, Limb Awareness Month. And you know what? When you know enough people that it just kind of oozes into May, that's a good thing. You know, we want to bring more power and more uh, um, awareness to what people are living like and how we all adapt. And so today, my guest is Christy Gardner. And uh, out from the East Coast, I appreciate our time changes, I think, three hours. So, but welcome to the show, Christy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, I would say, for probably two years now. And I, I had told you we were going to have you on. Um, I think you and I talked about you coming on because you were a a um, a runner up to go to the Olympics. Yeah, an alternate for the Tokyo Games. Thank you. I couldn't come up with the, the word. I'm like, or, or yeah, so alternate for what sport? Uh, for track and field. I throw shot put and discus. Nice. Okay. So for those of you listening, you know that we've had a, quite a, a, an array of people on a lot of Paralympians on this past month. Um, but with Christy, what's really special and endearing to me is the fact that um, she is a wounded warrior. She served in our U.S. military, and I'm so proud to, to say she is a friend of mine and that she is on our show. Um, Christy, can you just kind of, um, before we get into the meat of everything, where were you raised? What was your childhood like? What, what led you that direction? So actually I'm from Maine, uh, technically born and raised, but my parents were divorced. So like most split families, we spent a lot of time in two locations. So mom's side was here in Maine. So we grew up, you know, swimming in the Creek and skating on it in the winter with a tree swing and all that. And then school breaks were mostly spent in New York city. So we truly had like the best of both worlds, like country life and city life and everything at your fingertips in New York and very cool. playing in the dirt here in Maine. Very cool. Very cool. And brothers and sisters, you have a big family or? Uh, yeah, I have an older brother and a younger brother and then a stepbrother and a stepsister. And the stepsister and I are actually only a few days apart in age. So we went to school together the whole way through. Oh, wow. All right. Um, so that, it was kind of interesting that way. Um yeah, I mean, and then we have a huge family. My parents were each one of four. Mm -hmm. And so I have a ridiculous amount of cousins and most of them are either right in New York or here in Maine. So oh. we spent a lot of time together and a lot of family parties and things. But my grandfather was a Marine in the Korean War. My uncles were Marines, um, one served in Desert Storm. And then my cousins were in the Navy the same time I was in the Army. So wow. it's a pretty military family too. Very much so. Okay. So I'm, I'm guessing then that's what uh, prodded you that direction. You were just, that's what you knew. Yeah. It wasn't always an option for me. I actually wanted to go to med school and become an orthopedist. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, people, we all both have dogs. She has, she'll get to it, but she's got a plethora of dogs over at her house right now. And, uh, we're not always so lucky to know exactly what they're going to do and when. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, um, for track and field, I'm building an indoor throwing arena here at my house so that I have my home gym and, you know, obviously throwing a steel ball outside in Maine in the winter sucks. So <laughs> I'm going to have a whole indoor facility, but they're working on it. So the uh, noise and the dogs barking is when the contractors come and go. Oh, man. It's yeah. a busy life. Yeah, I apologize for Libby, but she always that's, lets me know when someone's coming. That's awesome. No, we're dog lovers, so it's good. Um, okay, so you got in. Um, did you go through, did you get into the Army after high school? I actually went from college. Um, okay. After high school, I went to college in New York. I went to Long Island University. Okay. And I was there in school on September 11th. And so obviously that was a big deal that changed lives for a lot of us. Yes. Uh, the Biggest thing I remember on, on that day, of course, is the worry for all the people that we couldn't get in touch with um, and the smell, just the smell from the bodies in the city was just horrendous. Really? Um, and so, you know, looking forward from there, having the military background and having the country really throw themselves back at this to, to combat the terrorism, um, mm -hmm. it was really a great option for me and a great career move to really support our country and, and do all the things that I could do. Wow. 
Well, that's, that's amazing. And I'm inspired by that. What um, rank did you get to? I uh, sergeant. sergeant, sergeant, sergeant in the army, in the military police. Oh, really? An MP. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And um, how long did you serve? Unfortunately, only three and a half years. So I've never done anything to the bare minimum. And I actually had signed a five-year contract because I planned on being a lifer. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you can retire between 18 and 20 years. And I was aiming for 22. Wow. But three and And a half was it. What happened? Can you tell us? Um, Yeah, I was on a peacekeeping mission overseas attached to an infantry unit. And uh, we got attacked by locals. So not an IED. And I ended up with a spinal cord injury, some organ damage, uh, lost, I crushed my left arm. So if you can see, I lost a couple oh. fingers too. Wow. Um, and had a couple skull fractures, facial fractures, and a TBI. But with the spinal cord injury is what eventually led to the amputation of my legs. So I had some torn ligaments anyway, but then with the, the spinal cord not being able to control the legs and atrophy of the muscles and you know, not good circulation from all the trauma. So it ended up, you know, my feet degraded and time to get rid of them. Wow. And how long between that incident and amputation was there? About eight years. Really? Yeah. Eight years using a wheelchair and the leg braces and the doctor's saying, you know, your feet are too fragile to use them. So stick with the wheelchair and be thankful you're not a quad. Um, obviously I didn't really follow all of their advice and push the limits always, but I knew I liked you. (laughs) We could be sisters. I think sometimes I don't listen to what's probably best for me because I'm so stubborn. Mm -hmm. I just say driven, but most people like my husband would say stubborn. (laughs) Well, and I was told, um, my mom tells the story all the time that my, I think it was my kindergarten teacher said that I was horribly, horribly stubborn in school, but that someday it would pay off. Um, and they, they truly believe that the stubbornness is what helped with my rehab. I would, I would say 100%. I don't know much about your story, except what everybody's heard just now. And I would say for any situation, when we see people succeeding or not succeeding, there is some grit, determination, and stubbornness that accompanies success, you know, especially through hard times. So, okay. So with that, I can't even begin to imagine, um, So for those of you that are listening, um, you know that I'm an above knee amputee at left side. Christy is a double below knee, correct? Okay. And so you do have sets of legs. You do walk now, right? You're always out and about. I think I've seen you. I can't even begin to imagine how hard it would be to learn to have both. I mean, I'm glad you have your knees. Right. <laughs> Although that is another thing that could go, which is always so hard because I'm, I'm actually thankful that my one knee is gone because I'm just so frightened about my other knee. You know, yeah. it puts, a, it, there's a lot of force on it. And I'm sure with you, you're probably feeling that with your knees as well. Well, and especially my back, because I don't have a sound side to lean on. So it affects your posture. And yeah. no matter how much core work I do, my posture is still slightly off. Um, so it just, yeah, it's a trick. Yeah. On back and hips. Yeah. That ripple effect, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so what was it like for those eight years? I can't, being in a wheelchair, being a gung ho person that wanted to do everything and be a part of it all. How, how did you manage through that? Like, so I rehabbed on active duty for about a year and a half. And then I was discharged because I was medically stable. I was certainly not recovered, but was stable. So I was transferred to the VA for another three and a half and um, did you know PT and OT and speech therapy because a lot of the stuff was with my brain injury. I had some motor control issues anyway and speech was practically non-existent. And so I started back over at the third grade with those stupid multiplication sheets that we had to do back in the day. No cow. Um, and went through all of that and all of that rehab and the doctors had given me a three page list of things they said I would never do again that I would never walk, that I would never ride a bike or swim or even live alone because I'm such a hazard with all my disabilities. Um, And so that was pretty awful and and pretty depressing. And I, after I got healthier, I lived with my parents and eventually was able to live on my own again, thanks to my service dog. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moxie was incredible and helped with so many things and, um, you know, just really gave me my life and my independence back. But With that, um, I was at the VA for physical therapy once, and there was another veteran and his service dog. And so we kind of like met and bonded over the dogs. 
And he was always pushing me to come to these events with him, come to these adaptive sport things. And I was like, you know, why do I want to go to that? Because the doctor said, I'll never do any of those things again, ever, mm-hmm. you know, like throw it in my face that I'm going to go sit there and watch someone else do it. Right. And he bugged me constantly to go. And I finally said, dude, if I come, will you stop bothering me? And he said, yes, you know, absolutely. Like at least give it a shot. And I went and it was called a VA fun in the Sunday. And we were at the beach, which is a nightmare anyway, as an amputee or wheelchair user. No kidding. (laughs) But we went um, water skiing. The whole day was water skiing and kayaking. And I was like, yeah, right. I can't, like, I can barely walk. You want me to water ski? And I actually got up and off the boom, did two laps around the lake and never fell. And so they said that set the tone for everyone else for the whole day. Because here I was a rookie and I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot and succeeded. So that kind of just gives everybody else a little confidence boost that, all right, she can do it. I can do it. Yeah. And from there, like you said, ripple effect, like the way it just changed the tone of everything else for my life. Because it was like, if I can do this, what else can I do that the doctors are wrong about? Ah, so I love that. I can do everything off the list, except for wiggle my toes. <laughs> True. I get that. Although sometimes I feel like I can. Oh my God. It, especially when you get the little weird nerve sensations. Oh. And that's an everyday event. And I'm sure you feel it too. It's, you know, it's just, there's times where you're like, oh, to stop. And I tell people a lot, I use distraction. If I'm not busy, yes. it will get to me. So, you know, and I, I tell people that because I think a lot of people that may listen are, are really frustrated with their medical condition, whether they're amputees or not, or going to be, or just horrible medical conditions. And they can't do a lot. Right. And so they're sitting at home. Well, that just, compounds it yes. you know okay. there's got to be something I even say get outside and smell fresh air don't sit on the couch Just, yes. even fresh air can do wonders for your mental state you know and so I can totally envision this you get out there and you're you water ski and you're like holy cow because that had to have been a huge just boost for you that was without a doubt the turning point in my recovery yep. um so from there, I went with Neil to like every adaptive sport thing ever. You know, I've even been to the point of like skiing in Park City, Utah and Snowmass, Colorado, and just traveled the world now doing adaptive sports. It's, and it's I amazing. Would have, yeah, I, you know, I would have never imagined my life like this. I had my going away party for Tokyo and somebody asked my grandmother and said, you know, are, are you sad for her, for her loss, you know, for losing my limbs and all that and for everything I went through? And she goes, you know, it's opened so many doors for, for me. And it's so true. Like there, I've done so many cool things now that I never even thought of or heard about before. Yep. Yep. And the one of them is the sled hockey. Like I had no idea what that was. And it really comes down to the only, I started getting into it. I Literally. It. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, it was literally my first outing to get my nails done after my amputation. <laughs> No joke. And um, crutches, because I don't have my leg yet. Yep. And, and a lady walked up to me and she's like, can I ask you? And, you know, of course, and I'm, and I was always open about it. You know, it wasn't traumatic. I elected my surgery. Um, but she's like, my husband actually coaches the Coyotes hockey, sled hockey team. And I'm like, the what? Right. <laughs> Here's me Google searching sled hockey. What is it? You know, I didn't even realize it was out there. She goes, you should come. So like you, I'm like, well, I'll go and watch. As soon as I got there, everybody's like, come on the ice. I'm like, I'm not dressed. I'm like shorts and a t-shirt. I, I, I'm just watching. And then I, I decided to try it. And it was frightening at first to do something so different, but it's, it's fun. And your background with sled hockey, tell, tell us about your sled hockey experience. Yeah. So that was, again, another one that Neil kind of dragged me to. It was a winter sports clinic up here and it was mainly ski and snowboard. But each night they introduce a new sport. So it was like kayaking in the hotel pool and wheelchair basketball. And the one night was sled hockey. And I was like, well, crap. All right, I'll try that. Like, but I only made it through like 20 minutes. And I'm pretty sure I spent the entire time falling over. Oh, yeah. Uh, You know, it's a great core workout. And then when you don't have those muscles, it's a nightmare. (laughs) But um, it was a tremendous amount of fun. And so the group that put on the clinic actually loaned me equipment for Mm -hmm. about six months. And then I tried out for the national team, like six months later was tryouts and I actually made the team. 
So I've been on the U.S. women's team now for like 12 years, I think, maybe 13, I'll have to check. But, um, you know, we've traveled the world, world championships. We've won every time. And it's just been an incredible experience. Like, I'm better at track and field, but I love hockey more because of the team environment. Yeah. And it's so fast and competitive. And, oh, you know, a is. lot of times <laughs> it's awesome. But, but people look at us as disabled and they're like, oh, my God, like, you got to be careful and, and all this other stuff. And or like if you've ever fallen or tripped or whatever, and people freak out. They do. People panic because a handicapped person fall down. Like if a normal person fell down, they wouldn't care. Right. But for some reason, we're special on that note, and it's just yeah. like we're fragile. But, yeah, exactly. I mean, I am, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I've broken like fifty six bones now, so it's a little ridiculous. Well, you know what? And I've never and ever injured my ribs until after being uh, yep. and sled hockey has led me to a fractured rib. And a couple, it, I'm aggressive. Let's just put it that way. And when you go for it, there's really not, I don't have breaks. <laughs> I haven't figured out right. the breaking. Oh no. So but that's yeah. one of my favorite things of the sport, because like you said, people look at us as fragile and yeah. then we get to go out and regardless of gender, it's full checking. Oh, it is totally. So we're just railing each other. And like my job on the national team now is a little bit more of an enforcer. So if you've got the puck, I'm, I'm putting you in the wall. Like, yep. good luck. That's Man. my job. Yeah. See, I go to enforcer because I don't have any puck skills. <laughs> if you can't handle the puck, you might as well hit somebody. Exactly. That, see, that's the brother. We have brothers. Yeah. I have big brothers. <laughs> you know, you just well, had to hold your own. Oh, say all the gender stuff now. I'm like, well, crap. I was a tomboy back then, but now they probably considered other stuff. I'm like, I don't care if I had GI Joes and a tree swing. Yeah. No, I was total tomboy growing up. Yep. I was. So interestingly enough, I, my first memory of actually conversing with you through social media was right at the pandemic. You had moved yourself to do surfing. So you were down in California. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually there for track. Oh, you, that's right. You were. Yep. And, and I was so stoked. I was going to go. I had just surfed for the first time as an amputee and I got up and there is nothing, nothing that compares to that really. feeling. So, Plus when you fall, it doesn't hurt like cement. Yes, exactly. It's really a fun sport to learn to, to do through falling in water versus cement. But I remember I was planning on coming out. I had, I had everything lined up. My one son and I were going to drive it. My other son and my husband were going to fly. Pandemic was as a, as a parent, I was like, we didn't know anything at this time. I think it was May of twenty. That I think March. Bikini, was it March? Oh, it was yeah, really the, right at the, the shutdown was literally the day after the finals for surfing. Well, and there were several teams that didn't make it because it was a world. And there were yeah. several teams like Italy was not allowed to leave their country. Well, and even like France went home before the finals because they were so worried about not being allowed to go home. Yes. So you and I had actually talked because I said, ah, I really wanted to be there. And I had put that out there on the, the Adaptive Surf, um, I think, Academy Facebook group. And you're like, Oh, you're kidding. We wanted you to come out. We don't have any standups for surfing. I'm like, I've surfed once. And you're like, well, me too. They're going to teach you. And I'm like, no, that's really backwards to compete before you really know what you're doing. I'm like, I don't even know if I could totally paddle out by myself yet, but that was, I've never forgotten that. And I thought, you know, someday we'll meet someday. We'll figure it out. We'll do it together. Um, so how much surfing have you been able to do? Cause I know that after all that, what ended up happening? Cause you were, you had literally found a place to live and stay for several months, right. To train for track and field, to do the surf um, championship. But then you, I remember your cross country track driving back with the dogs. Yeah. So I was living in Chula Vista or uh, training at the Chula Vista training center yep. for track and field. And it was kind of funny because here, my life is go, go, go. Like you said, you know, we don't do the boredom thing. It's better to stay busy. And they said, well, all right, well, because here I do so much. They're like, all right, you need to find a hobby out there. And that's when Sarah had asked me to join the surfing team um, and be in the kneeling class because I'm a double amp. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, sure, whatever. Tell, you know, tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll do it. But yeah, I was supposed to stay out in California until August of that year for the summer games. And then the games got postponed. My sponsorships got postponed. I, you know, everything was just a mess because of the pandemic. And yeah. California was so strict that you couldn't go anywhere or do anything. You literally oh. had to put on a mask when you stepped out of your apartment door. There was no doing anything. 
Um, and just, you know, it, it got to the point where I couldn't do anything. I was trapped in this little tiny room because it was an 800 square foot apartment and I'm used to having a yard and land. Yeah. And when the sponsorships and everything fell through, they came out with, well, if you have a financial situation, you don't have to stay, you can break your lease. And I was like, well, I can't train because the training center was shut down. Mm -hmm. There was nowhere in the area for me to work out on my own or throw on my own. And, you know, they closed the gym in our condo complex and like literally everything was shut down for months. Yeah. And I said, you know, at home, I have a sweet home gym set up. I can throw in my own yard because I have land. So I might as well just leave California and go back home and put in the work on my own. Right. So it, it meant leaving my coach and everybody behind, but we weren't allowed to do anything. We yeah. could talk to each other on the sidewalk, but I couldn't train anywhere. Right. So, and, and there was so much uncertainty. You had no idea how long that was going to last. Right. And the center ended up staying shut down for more months anyway. Yeah. So I really would, I mean, I could have surfed on occasion, but they didn't even allow that some of the time. Yeah. It's a little ridiculous. Well, they weren't even uh, allowing people to stay on the beaches, right? And stand no, you, around or congregate. You couldn't. Yeah, you couldn't stand still. You, if you were walking the beach for your daily exercise, we were allowed out for a walk and that was it. No chairs, and, no blankets. Yeah, correct. <laughs> and no parking. Wow. So they limited it to whoever could walk to the beach. So like if you lived right in the area, you could be walking there, but there was no parking allowed. That's crazy. So, yeah, it was so a how much, crazy. How much surfing did you end up doing? Um, I did do some in California and um, got to do a little bit more before I left and then came back here and, and Maine is easy to social distance. So pr everything was pretty well open. You just had to wear a mask in stores. So yeah. I got a new board from Amp Surf and met Dana down at the beach a few times. Uh, and we yeah. surfed in like York and, you know, Long Sands Beach. Maine, I did so. see all that. I'm like, that sounds like that, that would be cold surfing. Is it? Cold? Um, well, that was the funny thing. Cause in California, everybody laughed at me because I wore a summer suit. You know, it's like February and March and we're training and I'm wearing a summer suit, but as a double amp, I overheat so easily. Yeah. Anyway. And then I'm used to main water temperature and main air temperature. So Southern California was hot for me. Yeah. I'm a total wimp. Our you water here is like 43 degrees right now. So no. Yeah. What's the air temp right now? Where are you, where you're at? Uh, 66 today. Oh, you're, you are still chilly. Oh. Yeah, that's not Arizona temperatures. <laughs> that's our summer weather. <laughs> They're all talking about how we're like a month ahead of schedule weather-wise. Wow. Yeah, that's a different. That's a different place. That's we've we've lived in. Well, Illinois was home forever, and so you know I get the winters. I understand it. Um, started skiing when I was like seventeen with my husband back then, high school sweetheart. And then once he got his first major job, we started a family. Literally right after my second one was born, like three months, we moved to Florida. And got to enjoy the ocean. And then, yeah. the, then he got transferred out here to Arizona. We love it because you can hike everywhere. And that's quite a challenge. And I love the challenge that hiking different terrain brings. I'm not yeah. a street walker. I hate being on the street and pounding pavement. I hate it. It's, it doesn't only, feel good. I like pavement for running and that's about it. Yeah. Well, even then I don't really like it for running because it scares me because I fall every time I run. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it's the not having the knee and I've, I've got in my head on my, yeah. my running blade. And we're not, I say, we're not friends yet. <laughs> yeah. We don't see eye to eye yet. So, but well, yes, one, I do five K's all the time and oh. there's one called the bridge run. Okay. And for any amputees listening that, that get this, it's multiple different types of terrain. So you go over pavement and concrete and wood slats on a bridge. And then one set, one of the bridges is like the composite material. Mm -hmm. So it's so many different surfaces. So on a running blade, the transitions are brutal. Yeah. I don't think people realize that if you're not an APT, even for me, like shoe changes. Yes. Big time. It's huge. Like I think for about a year, I was like, I need the flattest, hardest sole ever. <laughs> and now I shift and it does take about you know, maybe five or 10 minutes walking around my house to get the gist of the new shoes that I'm wearing for this outfit, that outfit. But I pretty much live in my, like my I, I running shoes, but they have the best traction, the best soles. So, yeah. and they help your alignment for your hips and back. Right. Exactly. We, we need to take care of that stuff. Yeah. Well, right. and it's funny. We oh, just had our big fundraising gala Yeah. for the service dog program. Yeah. And at the end of the night, we were required to clean up that night. 
so all of our board was there and you know we're all dressed to the nines and, and I had heels on and a dress and all fancy and everything and then we had to swap out after the event ended and everyone left we turned all the lights on and started to fold up the tables and chairs so I had to swap out from my heels back to my sneakers I was like oh my god it feels like if you if you've ever jumped on a trampoline and then you have to get out and walk and you're yes. like the ground feels weird that's exactly yeah. that is the best description that is I, I you must have uh the nice kind of ankles that move for you to wear heels I threw all my heels away I will never wear a heel again I've got boots cowboy boots okay with a small Little. heel yeah but it has to be so really I got lucky um because I look like this all the time uh gym <laughs> clothes you know I, I'm wearing gym shorts with pockets and sneakers right now Mm -hmm. and my mom nominated me for a thing on Rachel Ray yeah so I got a makeover on Rachel Ray and they surprised me and flew my prosthetist down <gasps> and gave me these feet called the runway yeah. and it has an adjustable ankle so you can change it for the different height heels that you have nice so those are my fancy feet the fancy feet well you know everybody needs them I'm actually hopefully knock on wood getting a pair of ankles that will adjust you know, I should say an ankle that adjusts. So I'm hoping yep. that I can actually wear some, of, I'm not going to go back to heels. I have no yep. desire to wear heels. I'm a, I'm a gym rat. I'll stay that way. But every once in a while, a good cowboy boot that has a little bit more of a lift would be nice. Otherwise I just tip forward. Yes. <laughs> and then your posture is even worse. I know. Right. Yeah. All right. So tell me, I know this, this will be sad. I know. You, your first real experience with having a service dog was Moxie. Yeah. Yes. And, and yeah. Moxie. She, she, she was incredible. You know, she really was. Um, my whole family knows it. They all credit her with saving my life yeah. because if it wasn't for her, I would have gave up. Mm -hmm. And um, she was a mobility assistance and PTSD service dog yeah. and worked for me for about 12 years. She retired uh, last April and Doug took over. Doug's the one that I rescued from Phoenix Yep. Um, during the pandemic. So that was fun. Yeah. But, you know, Moxie was incredible. She was exactly what I needed in my life. She helped me out with everything and kept me going. And if I didn't want to get up, she was right there to say, nope, you're going. We're going for a walk or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, she was just absolutely incredible. So she changed my life and saved my life. And yeah. Unfortunately, she passed away about seven weeks ago. Yeah. And I know I lost our, when you lose those fur babies that have taken you through stuff, you know, um, I get it. And I, my, my heart bled for you. when I heard that, cause I understand, especially because it was a, it was a turning point in your life and she yeah. was all a part of it. Well, and even that I, I know that she was old, she was getting old and she did have cancer, but she was full of it. Like she was, it's funny because as she retired, she got such an attitude. Mm -hmm. um, she was like, no, I don't have to do that anymore. And she would bark at me when it was snack time and silly things like that. Uh. And so like the day before we went for a hike and we went and saw my parents that night and she was barking at my mom in the kitchen. So of course my mom was slipping her extra pieces of chicken and stuff. And she was just full of piss and vinegar. And yep. the next morning was gone. Wow. So it was just totally unexpected at that point. Yeah. And that's tough. I, I know that we lo actually lost our, our lab in the middle of the pandemic. So that was tough. So I, I understand that totally. And it was, um, you know, those dogs are everything. Yeah. They're the, Definitely. they're the, uh, the kids that really don't talk back except occasionally. Right. <laughs> yeah, just and the they end. do have a little sass and that's okay. Yeah. So tell us where that's led you now. What, what are you doing? Because you've got, you obviously are still very active. Um, if you, if anybody looks up to any of um, Christy's videos, you'll see Moxie on the ice with her when she's getting all set up to getting her sled for sled hockey. So are the, how many dogs do you have in your house right now? <laughs> right this minute, I have 13, I think. Yeah, no. 13. I have no idea. <laughs> and are they all, are they all golden retrievers? Um, 11 are goldens. And then I have a black lab and a Bernadoodle. Okay. And so it's funny. It kind of started. So when I was in California training a rescue group out of Phoenix, so they had this golden retriever that was five and a half months old. 
Um, unfortunately, his person had overdosed. And they said, you know, we don't know what he's been through or what he's seen or how long he was with the body, but they wanted me to have him to give him a good life. And I went out and met him and, you know, it took us a week or two to name him. I called him puppy for a little while, Yeah. but his name is Doug because he's named after Doug from the Disney movie up. I was kidding. He's the the biggest happy goofball you've ever seen. You know, (laughs) he did, he was been training to be a service dog for someone else. And they said, no, no he's perfect for you. Like this came about while you were in California, like it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And so I started training him for me. And when he's working with me, he's all business and he's so perfect. But when his friends are around, he is the biggest class clown ever. (laughs) No kidding. Oh, Oh, he's so funny. So now are, are those dogs that are all living with you, are they all yours or are you doing something for others Mm -hmm. with them? So when I came home from the pandemic, I was actually still in quarantine and another breeder reached out and said, Hey, we have a puppy. We want to donate to a veteran. Can I train it? And I was like, yeah, sure. So it was funny. Cause I was still stuck in quarantine, like from traveling across the country, yeah. my state was quarantined for two weeks when you travel. Yeah. And so I couldn't even get out and like get the dog kibble or anything. So everybody's dropping off the supplies we needed for the new puppy. And I started a trainer for a veteran and so many people started reaching out in need. So in July of 2020, we format formed mission working dogs and we train service dogs for PTSD as well as mobility assistance. And we also train therapy dogs for the community. So like schools, nursing homes, hospitals, mental health centers, especially during the pandemic, mental health was obviously a big issue. Very much. Um, So Dougie was in our first graduating class. We had four service dogs, three for veterans and one for a civilian. Oh. And then um, at our April gala, we just graduated a class of therapy dogs. So wow. One crisis response, one's a school therapy dog for an elementary school, and the other works at a local doctor's office. Wow. Um, so the crew that I have here, Doug is mine, and the rest belong to Mission Working Dogs. And we actually have 41 in our program right now. Holy cow. Yeah. So, so are the ones that with you, like, are you working with them throughout the day in your own home? Yeah, they're at my house right now because our training center is still under construction. Okay. Um, thankfully, it's right up the street. So I'll be able to walk to work when the time comes. Maybe not in the winter, but <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's only like a 15, 20 minute walk. So it'd be nice. Oh, and it's wow. great with the dogs. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, so our, our campus is a 10 building campus that will all be wheelchair accessible. Mm-hmm. And the main building that's under construction right now is the training center. So it'll have training classrooms for the dogs. Okay. So all the different supplies and things we need to teach them for, you know, helping with the laundry or doing lights and access Mm -hmm. buttons and fetching things we drop. And, you know, Doug's not, he's getting pretty good. He picked up a receipt off the floor the other day for me and he can obviously do bigger things like drill bits and soda bottles or pills or anything like that, that I drop. Wow. Um, Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, how did you, do you have training background? Did you get trained to train? Are you, how does that work? How does someone get in? Yeah. Yeah, So Moxie made such a difference in my life. Um, Before I went away for track, I was actually working at a Labrador breeder and they had one bloodline that specifically was incredible. You know, they have hunting dogs and they have family dogs, but this one line was so adept at working, you know, working, knowing people's needs and and assisting that way and learning and and just so smart and patient because a lot of times you get smart and stubborn. Yes. But this bloodline was just perfect. And so a lot of service dog programs would reach out to us. They taught me how to temperament test and select puppies from litters to go off to school. And then I learned how to become a puppy raiser. So I started learning, you know, the basics of training puppies and how to socialize them to different environments. Everybody thinks socializing is like going to play with other dogs, but it's not. It's desensitizing them to noises and environments, you know, crowds and sporting events. Hockey is a great way to train the dogs because there's so much crazy noise in the arena and different smells, you know, between the checking and the Zambonis and right. No, that's true. Well, I have to ask too, when (laughs) I I never realized this, um, we have one puppy that we got in January. And when people get dogs, they all of a sudden realize, oh, it's like having a kid again, having the baby again. The problem Mm -hmm. is, is I'm usually the main caretaker and I'm the one that doesn't sleep well at night. I hear everything. That's the mom and me. That's always listening for kids crying when they were little. Yep. 
I can't even begin to imagine your home being a double amputee. I struggled for weeks because if she got up in the middle of the night and a chihuahua, she was five pounds and her bladder was about yay big. I, you know, I was constantly, you know, on alert, on alert, but I can't just slip my leg on. Right. And so how hard, I mean, I can't, I I guess they're all pretty young dogs. I I would think you wouldn't start an older dog into training. So they're probably young puppies that are potty training and stuff. How do you do that? Or maybe is your leg slip on faster than mine? Cause mine does not. No, no. And the worst is like waking up for the middle of the night, like you're on high alert. I am not, um, with my PTSD, I take medication to sleep. Oh. And so all of a sudden when I hear a puppy cry, I'm like, oh my God, now I gotta get my balance and get my bearings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it takes a minute to get me over there. Yeah. Um, my home is wheelchair accessible, which is helpful. Oh, true. So that's, that's been a huge blessing, but even so like getting down to reach a tiny puppy or, you know, they don't make it to the door quite, quite there and you got to clean up a piece bill. And so we yeah. go through cases of paper towels and, and Lysol wipes yeah. because we do, we start them all as puppies. So right. the oldest one here right now turned one in December. Oh my so gosh. like one and a half. <gasps> yeah. They are but, puppies with a lot of well, energy. We, yes. So we started breeding our own. So we have our first litter on the ground and we kept four to use for our service program. And so those guys are here and they're five months old now. So I'm still chasing them around and pooper scooping the backyard for 13 is a nightmare. Well, those guys dogs too. Yeah. Yeah. I walk around with a five gallon pail, but (laughs) five month olds are 60 pounds already. Yeah. I I'm just, I literally, I I was feeling pretty bad for myself trying to get a chihuahua out the door. I can't even begin to imagine that many dogs. Well, and like you said, being a zombie at night, like um, one of the puppies had a cleft palate oh. because I didn't realize next guard flea and tick is known to have birth defects. No, um, the dogs really need to be on front line okay. for the breeding dogs. Good to know. And I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, you know, I said, flea and tick, they're protected and it's from the vet. So it's prescribed. Wow. And the kitty cats. Um, I don't yeah, know how the cat, silly. one cat, how many cats are there? Uh, two. They're, they're great then, desensitization for the puppies too, but they're also like to be chased. Um, but yeah, so the little one needed tube feeding every three hours. Oh. And, you know, the vet said, you know, take 48 hours and decide if you want to keep doing this or not. Um, you know, cause there's the humane way and mm. I got a little attached. Yeah. So I ended up tube feeding her every three hours for six weeks. Holy cow. So round the clock for six weeks. And then, um, she was able to start eating on her own. <laughs> He's so mad at me right now. <laughs> She's actually great. It's a great picture. <laughs> right. You're super cute. She was um, famous. Right. You need your TV time too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the little one got fed around the clock and we'll have surgery to repair the cleft. They can't do it until they're six months old. Wow. So I don't have to get up for night feedings anymore, but we had to make custom meatballs of puppy chow with canned milk smushed together and like little marble sized meatballs and right. fill them down the throat past the, past the cleft. Oh, so it truly was like having a baby and getting up and microwaving their formula and yeah. I mean, that's already taxing enough, but then you add in just a little bit, like just, I don't walk around without my leg on very often when it's yep. bedtime, that's when it comes off. Yep. And last night I was walking through and we're still working on some house training issues. And I was like, is that pee on the tile? Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, you, you, you can't just bend down and, and get it. Like I had to put the crutches aside. I had to get down on one leg and get on my knee. And then I had to try to get, just getting back up. I was like, oh, I'm so exhausted. <laughs> Well, and as a BK with sleeves, I can't kneel on them or it'll break them. Oh, yeah. And the stupid sleeves are like 300 bucks a piece. So I'm not trying to pop those. Yeah. So I do like a yoga forward fold and and reach down (laughs) with the paper towels. Pays off to be a little bit yoga-esque. Yeah. Right. A little flexibility here. It's good. Right. Exactly. So that's what you've been up to and you've got that opening up soon. Now, can I ask you, let's go back really quick. So we know that Moxie was a big portion of your, your turning point. Um, Probably I would say uh, mentally, especially. 
And same with that um, gentleman that got you to get out and see that you could do things. And, you know, I'm a very big advocate for the doctors that tell you you can't or you never will. That makes me so mad because I did when I was researching becoming an amputee and I hadn't yet. Um, I pretty much knew that that I I didn't have any other choices. I, I wasn't living my life. I was just barely getting by. And one of my doctors, I just wanted to, you know, get a couple opinions on what they saw. He looked at me, he walked in five seconds, looked at me and said, I'm not amputating. You'll never walk again. You're better off the way you are. And he walked out. I was like, oh, oh yeah. And then you're, then you're trying to justify, cause I chose mine. You, you know, you're trying to justify, is this true? And you know, that, that was, that wrecked me emotionally. And I had to come back down from that and everything. And, and obviously it paid off again. There are things that come into our way, like someone who said, you just try it, just try it. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And, and I have learned that saying yes and trying new things has not only shown me that I am more than capable, but it has led me to some amazing people. Well, and like you said before, um, you got, when you were getting into this and they said sled hockey and you're like, do what? Yeah. Right. The only thing I ever heard of was wheelchair basketball. I had no idea that there was this huge adaptive sport world out there. And there are so many opportunities for us. Mm -hmm. Very true. And, you know, and I, like I said, I've been skiing since I was 17 and my first goal was, you know, we were teaching our kids when they were just babies. Like I was holding up my two-year-old, he fell asleep between my legs. You know, they're, they're 18 and 20 now. So this kid, I missed all their growing, their awkward middle growing skiing phase because I was laid up and sitting down at the bottom, watching them go up ski, you know, the ski um, lifts and just so sad that I was missing out on, on those special moments. And, and I was, that was the first thing I wanted to get back to. And it was like December was my surgery of 18 And my husband is very good at planning things out. He already had an April ski. And I, before my surgery, I told my surgeon and prosthetist, he said, that's, I'm going to be skiing in April, just so y'all know. And they're like, (laughs) okay, you know, okay. (laughs) So I was on a sled with staples still in my leg. That's how soon after. Yep. Which was frightening. My husband was a little bit nervous because, and they were really good because it was mostly guys on the team and they're like, you guys, you can't run at her. Like yeah, she no, still has so her level, yeah. They're like, you're crazy. I'm like, yep, I've been told. And then <laughs> that April, because I had just gotten my prosthetic literally the week before, I'm like, I can't even walk in it. I surely am not going to ski in it. So what are my options? And of all the years I've skied, I really never saw any adaptive skiing. And I don't know how that's even possible. I, I never saw the the monoskis. I never saw any of that. So when I went to, um, I think it was Breckenridge first and then Salt Lake Park City and use their adaptive programs. They're like, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, what do you mean? What are the options? So I did, I did the outriggers, the three track, and that is a workout and a half. Yes. (laughs) Exhausting. I mean, exhausting upper body. I was so nervous about falling because I didn't want to try to have to get up. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's fun. And, you know, it's like the idea that you can do whatever you want. I tell my husband, I can do whatever I want. If I take it one step at a time, if you, if you look too far out at the end result, that's tough, yeah. but you can climb that mountain metaphorically, physically. If you just do one step at a time, you can get through anything, yes. but just don't look too far ahead. <laughs> and a lot of times your body is actually capable than of more than you think. You know, a lot of it's the mental hurdle. And so I, I played lacrosse in college and I coached lacrosse when I came home and I would still like try to play with the kids. Yeah. Uh, You know, I could shoot and all that, but I certainly didn't run very well. Right. Um, I actually got my butt kicked the other day by like a seven or eight year old at track. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure they loved it though. Oh, his opponent scratched and he was going to have to race by himself in the age group. And they're like, will you race him? And I was like, uh, Sure. But yeah, he killed me. It was awesome. He was so pumped. So tell me, you had said something about that. You worked also with Special Olympics. Yeah, I'm president of Central Maine Adaptive Sports. And so it's primarily a ski and snowboard club here in Maine. And when I joined the board, we added track and field, 
sled hockey, cycling, and kayaking. So we now have year-round programming for the kids. And this year we added bocce. So this morning we had bocce practice and we have our first bocce tournament on Thursday. So, so trying to teach, cool. teach the athletes the rules and how you play these things. So. How did you get involved with Special Olympics? Um, so I came home from the Rio Paralympic trials and I had placed first in both shot put and discus. And someone saw the thing on the news that I had gone and done this. And there was a girl that reached out. She had a stroke when she was a kid. And she's now in high school and she was the only person from the entire state that went to junior nationals and i was like how do we only send one kid from the whole state and yeah. it turns out there were, were no adaptive track and field clubs in the whole state so there was nothing for for kids with disabilities so i was like well that's crazy let's start a team and so we did and i, I joined Central Maine adaptive sports and added track and field as our first summer edition um, and she came out and threw with us for a while. And now we've got, I think, 16 kids on the team with different disabilities. Um, so That's I know that. so cool. But yeah, so we've, we've got quite a program and the kids are going to be participating in the Special Olympics Summer Games in June. So it's exciting That's to cool. give them the opportunities and see them grow too through their disabilities. Yeah, I, you have a very full plate. <laughs> yes. You do. But you know, again, it keeps your mind... on. It. I have found helping others and filling others buckets. One takes the pity party off of myself and my life and it allows me to grow. And, and actually I find that I, I feel a little bit better inside when I've done something for somebody else. Yeah. You know, I think that's just know, nature, but yeah, there's a little taboo on like inspiration porn, but I think when it's another disabled person, like a lot of times I get, um, you know, somebody reached out that was a single amp and was facing losing the other leg mm. and their family said, oh, you don't want to be a double amputee. You'll have no quality of life. Mm. You can't do anything. And they contacted me and I walked into the room and they were like, oh, shoot. Like, yeah. I do everything. I live on my own. I yep. do all my own yard work and maintenance. I planted a ton of plants and lilac bushes and stuff like that yesterday because I'm still new here at this house. Yeah. And I do everything for myself. I've rented a skid steer before and used a bucket loader and like they drop off the heavy equipment and I just get it done. Wow. And so to kind of show others that, yes, you can do virtually anything you try. Right. You know, it's always an option. Um, you know, I work at the, the local veterans home as well. And I bring in the therapy dogs usually as my thing to visit. And they had a, the nurse came out one day and she said, you know, we have this guy, typical Mainer. He was a logger. He got a cut on his ankle, not from the chainsaw or anything, but just a cut in the woods that got infected and he became a baloney amputee. And while he was rehabbing before he could even become, you know, learn to walk as a BK, he ended up the infection spread and he lost his leg above the knee. And at that point he'd been in the home so long and was just so frustrated. He had completely given up on physical therapy and things like that. And he said, will you just talk to him? I said, of course, you know, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to visit and make the guys feel better. So they rolled him out and he was in his crappy hospital wheelchair, not even like a nice day chair or anything. And he goes, holy shit, you lost both? I'm like, yep. And he's like, and you can walk? Like, yep. Yeah. So that was all the, all the kick in the pants he needed. But here I was, you know, female or not, standing there with no legs. And right. he was bitching about his. And so they said 30 days later, through physical therapy, he was discharged walking. Oh, that's awesome. So all he needed was to see that it's possible, that you can do that. Yeah. And then he got it to work. Well, I think that message is definitely needing to be heard. There are so many people out there that have been told by medical professionals that this can't, this can't, never, ever, ever. And, you know, just to empower people to say, you know what, you can it may not look good. It may not be perfect, at, but if you want it bad enough, you can do it. And I mean, it's not like uncommon. I mean, when I went into my amputation, you know, I'd heard plenty of stories of people that went into comas. They were told they'd never live, that they'd never talk, they'd never walk. And then they're, they're living miracles. It's like, you know, doctors have probably got to stop saying that whole never, or this isn't going to happen right. for you, or the chances of this is, you know, slim. But I don't know. I mean, for me, I think that was the kick in the pants I needed to prove somebody wrong. I'm so stubborn that it was like having my big brother saying, oh, you're a girl, you can't do that. And they knew that would just light a fire. 
So yeah. I just, I always think my faith helped me through a lot of this. I, I just figured that God put that person, that doctor into my life just to throw a wrench in and get me to thinking and, and power me up, you know, cause that, that worked. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I wish they wouldn't do the never thing. I wish they went more with the slim chance. Like if you work really hard, you might achieve it kind of thing. Yeah. I feel like they say never to so many people. Mm-hmm. And I asked one of the surgeons once at, at the rehab hospital here, and he says, they do it so that you don't have false hope. And I said, you know, but that's so defeating that you have no hope. Right. Like, why don't, why don't you just say that you'll have to work harder to do something? Right. You know, we had a little boy that lost his leg to cancer and he, the doctor said, you'll never be normal again. You'll never play sports again. I'm like, really? Like, did the doctor not know adaptive sports exist? And why would you tell a little kid he's never going to be normal? Yeah. Like, what even is normal? Like, right. The poor kid so upset and shut down, like, from that. Yeah, no, that, that definitely has to change. And you would think that they would at least say, well, well, we've seen this and we've seen this side of it. You can choose yeah. the route, you know, and, and no, we can't make guarantees. That's okay. I'm right. not looking for you to guarantee anything, but man, don't shut me down before you even know who I am. You exactly. know, no, I, I totally get that. Well, what would you say of everything that you've been through? Um, what were some of the biggest hurdles that you had to deal with? And just to give people that, that glimpse of hope, what is it that you think you have, or you did that got you to that next level and, and made you normal, uh, quote unquote. Right. I, I just, I guess just trying things, you know, yes, you might fail, but it's worth a shot. You never really lose much, maybe a little skin off your hands when you fall down, but it's worth trying and falling than not trying at all. And that first baby step into something might be the whole route to you running and climbing and hiking again. So just try, give it a shot. You haven't got enough to lose. It's worth it. For sure. I I agree with you 100%. Well, I would like to do it. I forgot to mention this to you. I like to play a game with my interviewees called this or that. It's just 10 questions and they're just kind of a speed round. I give you two things and you tell me which one resonates better with you. A lot of times it revolves around food. (laughs) Sorry, I'm a foodie. I love food. That's why I have to work out all the time. Otherwise we got a problem. All right, you ready? Not a lot of thinking. All right, here we go. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Milk. Comedy or reality? You mean like TV? Definitely comedy. Reality shows drive me nuts. Ditto. I can't do it. <laughs> I got enough reality. I don't need anybody else. not reality. It's so yeah. fake. No kidding. All right. Are you a night owl or morning person? Uh, morning person. Courtesy of the dogs. But oh, yeah. 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 They That's get up at like 530. <laughs> okay. So whether or not you're a coffee person, are you more iced or hot? I guess iced. I actually don't drink coffee at all. Oh, so what is your drink of choice? Water? Mountain Mountain (laughs) Dew. I'm so bad about water too. Like just Mount, it's still a patrol thing. When I was an MP, we patrolled 24 hour shift and a two liter of Mountain Dew fits in your camelback perfectly. (laughs) Well, and that'll keep you going. Exactly. If you have to pee, you can't fall asleep either. So no, that's true. (laughs) This is so true. All right. Are you summer or winter person? summer because you can play hockey year round indoors perfect okay then this might answer it hockey or surfing hockey because it's team sport cool salty or sweet Ooh, that's not a fair one i put salt on everything but i have an entire cabinet of gummies behind me awesome gummy bears i was having those yesterday dude if i could be sponsored by haribo i'd be thrilled (laughs) we should work on that I have a huge right. bag right now that I've been munching on. It's bad. Perfect. Bad. All right. Mountains or ocean? Probably mountains. I love the hiking and the view, but I also have a lobster license. So I spend a lot of time on the ocean. That's right. You did that right after you came back from California. Yeah. Our governor made a cool thing that if you're disabled, you can have a free license. So I do. And I pull the damn traps by hand. And do you, do you get fresh lobster then? Oh honest? yeah. I'm actually allergic to it though. <laughs> so oh, I give it away. Did you yeah. know that before you started that? Yes. Yes. 
So but you- I figured I live in Maine. It's a cool skill to have. <laughs> well, yeah. When you think of Maine, you think lobster, right? So I might as well learn to do it myself. Do you give it to your friends and family or do you bring in enough for a restaurant? Uh, no friends and family. I'm only allowed to have five traps in the water at a time. So the most I get is like 12 to 14 a week, <sighs> but there's a lot of low income veterans in our area. So mm-hmm. I usually give it to them as a treat. You are spectacular. Ugh. All right. Books or movies? Books. Eh, yes, both. I like to read the book first and then. Do you have a favorite? No, not really. I like action adventure kind of stuff. Okay. All right. And thick crust or thin crust? Can I just have the crust? Uh, right. That's all I'm you one need. of those people. I don't need the sauce and the rest of the stuff. Right. So. We take a lot of that off. I don't, I don't, we're Chicagoans. So we're thick crust people. Oh no. But a, yep. but a good thin crust and East yeah. coast I found tends to be more thin crust. Yes. Yeah. We don't have anything thick crust really, unless you make it yourself. Yeah. So when you say that, I'm like, do you mean like a decent crust or like the uh, gluten-free pita? <laughs> yeah, no, no, not gluten. We need the gluten. Every once in a while gluten is okay. Got to have the gluten. Oh, Christy. City. <laughs> that was so much fun that, that I'm so glad we finally got to talk. I look definitely. forward to you coming out here. So I will message you definitely, but um, we will definitely have to get together. You are phenomenal. You keep marching forward. I'm proud to know you proud that you served our country, that you did so with grace and class coming out of that, which is not an easy task. Um, I've had cousins that have served and one that did um, commit suicide. And uh, so I try to do a lot with mission 22. Um, You know, whatever I can do, it's little, but it's whatever I can do just because there is, you know, I think we need to support our troops. Um, And I can't imagine coming home and, and how life altering that can be. So God bless you. And thank you for serving our wonderful country. You're very welcome. I'd do it again if I could. I know you would. All right. Thank you, Christy.